Hi gang, Justin Zeltzer here for the sixth video on statistical inference. This one's a bit of a catch-all for other topics we haven't quite managed to squeeze in in the first five videos. Um, they're all somewhat related in that we can put them all under the sort of umbrella term of additional inference methods. So first up we have exact methods. Now that's exploring inference methods uh, where we do not use a normal approximation. You would have noticed in many examples in the previous videos, uh, we've used a very handy normal approximation when our sample size gets significantly large enough. So the exact methods will help us out if uh, we can't rely on that assumption. And after explaining the definition of exact methods, I'm then going to show you a binomial example. So we're going to use an exact binomial distribution. We'll then look at what it is like to sample from an empirical distribution. So that's actually the distribution from the sample itself with no additional assumptions placed on top of it. And finally, we're going to have a look at the concept of bootstrapping, which is very common in statistics. It's also known as a resampling method. Now, you might be noticing that there's potentially one topic missing here from all these, or one related topic that's often given alongside all of these, and that's non-parametric testing. Now, I'm creating a separate video for that, so we're going to do this one first, and then we can have a look at the non-parametric testing afterwards. Uh, I just thought it was going to be too confusing to put them all together in the one sort of flow diagram. As you'll see from the non-parametric video, it's uh, a little bit more involved. So this is everything bar non-parametric tests. Let's see how we go. All right, so what's exact methods? As I've noted in the intro, most inference involves asymptotic distributions assumed from large samples. And often we use the normal distribution in those examples, relying on something called the central limit theorem to get us there. So let's take a sample proportion and call it P. Now we often say that's normally distributed or effectively normally distributed with a mean of with the mean of theta which is the population parameter and the variance of theta times 1 minus theta on n and we say that that's normally distributed. But as we'll find out, it's only going to be normally distributed if n is sufficiently large. So here's a perfect example. Imagine I toss a fair coin once, and this might be the distribution of heads from that toss of a coin. Of course, I can get zero heads or one head from that toss of one coin, and both of those will have a 50% probability. Now, this is the extreme example where n is 1, and quite clearly this distribution is very discrete and absolutely not normal. So there's no way we could be describing the distribution of this sample proportion by this formula up here. But as you'll see, as we increase n, so say let's go to two tosses of a fair coin, because there are two ways of getting one head, so this is the distribution of heads from those two tosses, because there are two ways of getting that one head, that becomes more probable than zero or two. So it, it at least starts accumulating more data towards the middle here but still not very normal, very discrete and chunky at the moment. So let's continue and have a look at the distribution of the number of heads from 10 tosses of a fair coin. You can see now that while it's still a little bit chunky, it's starting to look a little bit like a normal distribution. You've got that bell curve kind of now appearing. And if you keep tossing coins, say there's 100 here, so this will be 50, our expected value, right in the middle. This is starting to look very nice and bell curved, isn't it? So what's happening here is that as n is increasing, this proportion, well in this case we've got the raw number here, but you could imagine this being 0.5 right in the middle here. The proportion is becoming more normal. And that's why we've been able to use this approximate distribution, this approximate normal distribution. And it's been very helpful because we'll be, we'll be able to find areas under this particular curve very easily, thanks to our normal distribution tables. So for example, in this case, 
would be able to find the fairly trivial result that the expected proportion of our sample having heads is 50%. But we could also find the variance of this particular distribution as being theta times 1 minus theta over n, which is 0 0.0025. And you could take the square root of that to get the standard deviation. Although keep in mind, this is the standard deviation for the proportion, not the raw number that we actually have in this particular diagram here. So the question is, what do you do if n is small? So in those first few figures I was showing before, we wouldn't be able to use that variance calculation. So how do you do it? Well, let's have a look at a, an example here, a binomial example. This one's to do with prevalence of anxiety in teenagers. And here's the question. A mental health survey was administered to a cross-section of students in New South Wales, of whom 25% were classified as having experienced clinical levels of anxiety during their schooling. So 20 students were sampled at Rosewood High School. Eight of these students noted clinical levels of anxiety. So let's test whether Rosewood students experience higher levels than the state's average. So it's a bit of a wordy question, but we're going to be using the exact test at the 5% level of significance. So what that means is we're going to be using the binomial distribution that results from this without relying on a normal approximation. So let's find out how that plays out. So our null hypothesis is that theta, the true population proportion at Rosewood, is equal to 0.25, and the alternate hypothesis is that it's greater than 0.25. Remember my hot tip for null and alternate hypotheses? Whatever you're seeking evidence for goes in the alternate hypothesis. So we're testing whether Rosewood students experience higher levels of anxiety than the state's average, which is 25%. So that goes in our alternate hypothesis with the converse going in our null hypothesis. So you could put here less than or equal to 0.25, but I'm just putting straight equal to 0.25. That's a convention thing. You could go either way with that. It's actually the um, alternate hypothesis that's more important. So, if the null hypothesis was true and we had a sample of size 20, this would be the resulting distribution of the possible sample results. Now, 0.25 of 20 is in fact 5, so you, you would expect somewhere around 5 to be the number of students experiencing anxiety at Rosewood. But because it's a random sample, you know you could get 4 or 6 or maybe 3 or 7, etc, etc. But it becomes increasingly less likely for 9, 10, 11 students out of 20 to have anxiety. So each of these bars that you're seeing in this distribution is simply a single instance of the binomial formula with n being 20 and theta being 0.25. So if we were trying to find the rejection region, it's as simple as trying to find the point at which there's 5% in the tail. Now this is where it's a little bit tricky because given this is a discrete distribution, you're never going to get a point where there's exactly 5% in the tail. So we have to choose a point that gets as close as we can to 5% being in the tail, making sure that we don't go over it. So this yellow region here represents 0.0409, so almost 5%, and that's probably going to be it for us. If we include this next bar, clearly that's going to put us over the top of 0.05. So our rejection region will be this yellow region here, which will go all the way to 20. So there, I've written it there, rejection region. And we're going to do so if X, the number of Rosewood students experiencing anxiety, is greater than or equal to 9. Because this is the number 9 here. But we got 8. We're on this side. In other words, we do not reject the null hypothesis. It didn't manage to get us in the rejection region. So what if you wanted to then find the p-value associated with this sample value of 8? Well, you can do it pretty simply on Excel. Um, this is the formula you would use. It's just going to be, it's just going to be 1 minus this function here, which is the binomial distribution, which gives us the cumulative distribution 
at a particular point that we select. So if we've selected 7, where 20 is the value of n and 0.25 is the value of theta, it's going, this little part of the formula will give us the region from 7 and below. So if we go 1 minus that, we'll get the region from 8 and above. And by putting true in the final argument of this function, that tells Excel to provide us with the cumulative distribution function, as opposed to the probability mass function, which would just be the singular individual heights of the bars. So you can do this on Excel. I'm sure you could do it on any other piece of statistical software, and it's probably less clunky than this. Uh, but this is the way I did it. And in doing so, we found that it's 0.102. So our p-value associated with this sample was 0.102. Being greater than 0.05, we know we do not reject. Thus, not enough evidence to suggest Rosewood has higher levels of anxiety than the state. So that was all done without reference to a normal distribution table. And as you can see, there are upsides and downsides to this method. Um, the upside is that it uses the exact distribution. So this is in some ways more correct than the approximation. However, we do get this weird clunky thing happening with our rejection region where it will never precisely match up with our level of significance. Okay, so let's move on to the empirical distribution. So I've said here, that let's consider a sample of size 25 with the following sample statistics. The mean being 5.31 and the standard deviation, that's the sample standard deviation, being 1.21. So what we could do with that is set up a parametric distribution. In other words, we predict that this might be a normal distribution with the mean of 5.31 and standard deviation of 1.21. And if that's the case, we'll get this black line for our cumulative distribution function. So I should probably have put that in the title here. This is actually the par parametric and empirical cumulative distribution function. It's a nice smooth curve. But if we're just looking at our sample, what we had in it was 25 exact observations between well, it happens to be between 1 and 9. I haven't shown you the whole sample here, but you can almost see it with all of these notches up on my um, empirical distribution. So each of these notches takes us up, well, exactly 1 25th, right? Because there are 25 observations. And yes, technically there shouldn't be diagonal lines here. There should be nice straight lines in each of these sort of notches upwards. It's just a feature of uh, me doing this in Excel. Nonetheless, you can see that it is quite discrete. So what, what can we actually do with this empirical distribution? Well, if you wanted to, you could start making inference based on this empirical distribution. So you might say that clearly this is our final observation here up at about 8.9 or something like that. So you might say that the probability of say x being greater than 8 is 1 on 25 but also the probability that x being greater than 8.5 is also 1 on 25. So it's possible to use this empirical distribution of the sample to make inference to the population. But in reality, that's kind of rarely done. Though as we're about to find out, the empirical distribution can be helpful when dealing with resampling. So let's have a look at bootstrapping now. As I've said here, bootstrapping uses resampling to generate new samples from the original sample. So let's just say we have an original sample, 1, 4, 5, 7, and 10. Let's zoom in a little bit. What bootstrapping does is it takes a similarly sized sample out of the original sample with replacement. So what does all that garbage mean? Well, I'm taking a selection, a random selection from this original sample as my first observation. That happened to be 5. I'm going to do the same thing to get my second observation. It was 7. My third observation happened to be 10. Now you'll notice my fourth observation is also 10. So you can get original sample values replicated more than once in this new replicated sample. Now once we have this particular bootstrapped sample, 
our replicated sample, we can find an estimate for the mean. And that happens to be 6.6. .6. It's the mean of all of those. Now what bootstrapping does is it does this process again and again and again. Many times, in fact. Often for a bootstrapping procedure, you might have a thousand replications. And as with anything in statistics, the more the merrier. It's just a question of your computing power and how long you want to wait for your program to get it all done. But you'll notice that each of these has its own estimate for the mean. And using these estimates, these replicated estimates, we can find an estimate for the standard deviation of theta hat. So if there are k replicated samples, the standard error of theta hat is just 1 on k minus 1 times the sum of each of these observations minus this global mean. And what that is, is, th is the mean of all the replicated samples. So if I was to add up all of these, all the k values here and divide by k, I'll get theta bar. So you're essentially finding the standard deviation of all of these. So that's pretty cool, right? That actually utilizes simulation. So when I run my bootstrap operation, it might get slightly different answers to your run of the bootstrap operation. But if we have enough samples, say a thousand, I reckon our differences are going to be pretty, pretty minor. Now, I thought I'd just finish up this section with uh, highlighting a potential alternative to bootstrapping, which is called jackknifing. It's definitely used less than bootstrapping, but all jackknifing does is that it creates additional samples from just removing one observation from the original sample. So the first jackknifed sample removes the 10, the next jackknifed sample removes the 7, then the 5, and the 4, and then the 1. So this is certainly deterministic, whereas the uh, bootstrap example uh, was simulated. So we should both get exactly the same jackknife, jackknifed set. So there we go, jackknifing. And again, the standard error is just calculated in exactly the same way. So um, it's as simple as that. Now in this particular jackknifing example, I've only taken one observation out for each jackknifed sample. But in reality, you could take as many observations out as you'd like, as long as it's consistent for every jackknifed sample. Okay, so that's it for this video. If you want to have a look at the additional video on non-parametric statistics, I think that's a really good one, so I'd suggest you do that. Um, that should be the next one in the series, which you can look at on zstatistics.com or alternatively, if you're looking at this at university, it'll just be on the module home pages.